Oh, I'm Misha here. And a bit ago, I did a video on the bombers of Britain's V-Force, which is the strategic nuclear bomber force that Britain used in the 50s, and they transitioned over to using them as conventional bombers in the 60s. And we had three planes for it. Now I thought we would look at the bombers Britain used during the Second World War. The strategic heavy bombers. These are actually all quite similar and also quite different. On the far left we have the very first one to be introduced. This is the short Sterling. In the middle we have the next to be introduced. This is the Hanley Page. Halifax and then finally we have kind of the star of the show the last to be introduced and the last to actually go out of service as well we have the Avro Lancaster as you can tell these are all four engine heavy strategic bombers. They have similar specifications. Originally could carry very similar bomb loads. They each have a crew of seven. Size wise they're pretty similar. The Sterling is the largest. It has the longest fuselage but also the shortest wingspan. The Halifax has the longest, widest wingspan and is the next longest. And then the Lancaster has the, the kind of just a little bit shorter wingspan than the Halifax and is the shortest of the three. However, it actually could carry the largest amount of bombs or the heaviest bombs. So it's kind of an interesting story how that came to be. All of these had their origins in the mid to late 30s, but in slightly different ways. The Sterling began in 1936, and it was really the RAF's first interest in four-engine heavy bombers. It entered into a competition and was ultimately the winner. It would prototype first fly in May of 1939. The Halifax and the Lancaster, though, a little more interesting story. These both started off as two engine bombers in a separate competition in 1936. At the time the RAF wanted to have a heavy two-engine bomber to save on resources. They thought that if they could just have two more powerful heavy engines that was the way to go. So actually the Lancaster began as the Manchester which won the initial trials and would even go into limited production and service in 1940. And the Hanley Page Halifax would be kind of its second stringer. It would be the backup plan, originally being a two engine as well, being reworked into a four engine. It would fly as a prototype in October of 1939, so just a few months after the Sterling. And because of the whole Manchester thing, the prototype of the Lancaster, which was originally known as the Manchester II, wouldn't fly until January of 1941. It's kind of an interesting story. So yeah, 
the Sterling was the only one to start off from the drawing board as a four engine. It was actually the RAF's very first four engine bomber. The other two began as two engines. And they also, of course, since they were different competitions, were kind of made to slightly different specifications. That said, the Sterling was produced in the smallest numbers at a little over 2,000. Next, the Halifax, they made a little over 6,000 of these. And then the Lancaster, even though it got started late, they would make the most of it a good bit over 7,000. And the Sterling would be essentially retired from service pretty early on, at the end of the war in 1945 although it had been taken out of frontline bomber service already prior to that. The Halifax would soldier on a bit longer, being surplused out in 1947. And the Lancaster would actually be produced until early 46 and still remain in bomber command service through the Korean War period, so the end of 1953, and the final ones would not be removed from the RAF until the following year, 1954. So it would last considerably longer than its stable mates. So with that overview in mind, now we'll kind of focus a little bit more on the details of each bomber, and then compare. All these are Corgi. 172 scale die cast. They're about a foot long each with a wingspan of a bit under 18 inches, a so foot and a half. Even though size wise they're a little bit different, with of course the uh, Sterling being the only one noticeably longer. In this scale, of course, you have to almost put them on top of each other to notice the differences as far as wingspan because they're very close. Kind of as with the V-Force video, instead of breaking this up into three videos, I thought just do one long one because it's kind of nice to compare and contrast all of these. So yeah, let's get right into it with the short Sterling. Sorry I don't have these on the spinny thing, but with all three on the table, it's just not really possible. They're just so big and kind of heavy, and these stands can pivot. The um, the short Sterling, like I said, in 1936, the RAF was interested in a four-engine bomber. It was kind of the first time, so they opened up a competition, and they had very stringent requirements. It had to be able to carry up to 14,000 pounds and bombs, or 24 troops had to be able to double as a transport. It had to be able to take off from a... 500 feet runway and also clear trees at the end of it but it could not have a wingspan in greater than 100 feet and it had to be able to at least get up to 230 miles per hour of course four engines yada yada it needed at least three turrets so pretty stringent pretty strict requirements and uh, early on late 36 a design from supermarine makers of the Spitfire, was favored, and really the entry, the Model 29 from Short, was kind of the second choice at best. But in 1937, Short kind of redesigned it, upgraded the engines, you know, tinkered with a few things, and therefore it was ordered in prototype form later in the year, and they would work through 38, and the prototype, as I said, would fly first in 19. 39. Because of ongoing things with Germany, the RAF would decide to order 100 of these as a backup, but then this was quickly increased to 1,500, so they would have these in addition to the Supermarine design. And it's good they did that because 1940, you know, you're in the, you know, Blitz and all that, German bombing. Things are slow going. The first production Sterling flew 
in May of 1940, and the first were delivered to squadrons in August, and they were considered operationally ready by January. And it's a good thing they were. Now, the, the production was slowed because of shortages and because of um, the bombing. The factories were bombed. But, whereas it slowed short in the Sterling, it basically obliterated the Supermarine design. In fact, the Supermarine four-engine bomber was officially canceled in November of 1940, meaning this was what the RAF had. So it was operationally ready. Its first missions were in February of 1941. Now, there weren't a lot available that year. Again, slow production because of the bombing raids. But by 1942, these were starting to become available in larger numbers, and by the spring, they were able to use them on more and more bombing missions. Originally, they tried to use them as daytime and nighttime bombers, but you know how daytime bombing went in, uh, in the early parts of the war. They would also use them as what they call pathfinders, meaning they would kind of lead the way for other bombers, plotting routes and everything. And really, by 1943, this had hit its zenith. They would be doing 100-plus sterling bombing raids. And yeah, production was up. They did consider making these in Canada, but before it could actually go into effect, never happened. So what do we have here? Well, like I said, it does have a crew of seven, as all these do. The body is 87 feet long. The wings are 99 feet wide, again because of the restrictions. This was actually based on the Sunderland flying boat. So it has a few interesting features. Originally, we would have the front turret, of course, with two machine guns. We have a rear turret, and the third turret would first be on the bottom, the ventral, but this was useless, so it was pretty much deleted immediately and temporarily replaced with two waste guns. But then they would soon go to a dorsal turret on the top. The first pattern of dorsal turret wasn't that great, so they would introduce an updated version with the Mark III. This could carry 14,000 pounds in bombs. Which is good. It was very impressive for an early war. But the problem is, and I brought up the little bomb bays here that you can plug into the corgi. This is the main bomb bay. It is 40 feet long, but it's divided because of the structure of the plane. There's a structural support that runs through the middle, meaning the actual sections are 19 feet long. And even more than that, they're further divided into cells. Meaning that 500 pound bombs will fit without a problem. But you're kind of restricted past that. There were also wing bomb bays. Little cells here that can hold additional bombs. These would be plugged in on the model here in between the fuselage and the inboard engine. So you have small bomb bays on the wings, two, and you have the long bomb bay. So if you're carrying 500 pound bombs, that's fine. But if you want to carry anything larger, which early on in the war they didn't have, but as the war were gone, they would develop it, you're kind of limited. The largest this could carry was a 2,000 pound armor-piercing bomb. And this was part of its problem. It really wasn't flexible, and there wasn't much to, they could do because this was structural support for the for the plane, the way the fuselage was made. Also, 
the earlier planes could make about 250, 250 miles per hour. Raider, they would upgrade the engines, and they would get up to about 270, but they were still kind of underpowered. A lot of it had to do with the wing and the structure that was forced upon the design with all the restrictions. The real problem was altitude. This struggled to get over 16, 16,500 feet in the air, and if it was going on a long-range mission, it could only carry about 3,500 pounds, so about seven 500-pound bombs, and that was into Europe. So it just didn't have quite the, the long range with capacity that they needed, and that was kind of its downfall. Also, while it handled well in the air, it had good turning, it was kind of a beast on takeoff and landing, again, because of the really tall landing gear it had and also the wings, the way they were done. So it, it had some kind of quirky, uh, dangerous handling characteristics during that phase. And again, it was kind of the first, so they were learning... But yeah, between the limited altitude, which left it vulnerable to fighters, and the restricted bomb capabilities, really, these were already being kind of taken out of production in 43, and the last ones were taken out of Frontline Bomber Command Service in December of 43, being replaced by the Halifax and the Lancaster. Now, the existing planes that they had were still used. They would use them for troop transport. They would also use them as a glider tug in 1944, especially during the whole Normandy thing. They would also use them for dropping paratroopers. And they would even use them for electronic warfare. So, they kept them around, of course, waste not, want not, and they were perfectly good planes for the most part. But they just weren't the best bombers possible. And they would make just shy of 2,400 of these in total. There were, of course, with many British planes, several marks. One, three. There would be some dedicated transport and tug marks going up higher. You know, different changes. And even within the marks, there are different series. They would change the engines a bit. They would use Merlins, Hercules... Different types of those, you know, all the minutiae you can easily read about, so I won't ramble on here. Of course, as with pretty much all these, the machine guns here are all 303 caliber, 7.7 millimeter. They really didn't use 20 millimeter cannon or 50 calibers like many of the other American bombers would. But I guess they felt it was sufficient. So yeah, the Short Sterling, the first of these, of the strategic heavy bombers, and the only one to be designed from the outset to be a four-engineer. Pretty much right after World War II, these were declared surplus, and pretty much all of them were out of service by 1946. Over 500 would be lost in combat, and they would deliver over 27,000 pounds of bombs onto Germany and its allies. Well, let us move on to the Hanley Page Halifax. As I said, this actually began as a two-engine design. That was the HP-56, which was in the competition in 1936 that uh, Avro would win that would result in the Manchester. This was kind of the second string option. And then in the summer of 37, the Air Ministry requested that Hanley Page maybe rework it into being a four-engine. The reason was, with the two engines, they were going to try to use powerful models like the Vulture, but they were having trouble, so the idea was, maybe we should kind of back up and use four 
Merlins or Hercules, something like that. So, what they had to do, they had to make a, a wider wingspan to accommodate the four engines and made some other changes. This resulted in the HP-57 in 1938. And even before the prototype flew, the Air Ministry ordered a hundred of them. So the prototype would go into the skies in October, very late October of 1939, proving relatively successful. And, uh, yeah, would be put into production. The first actual, you know, kitted up prototype, the second one that was set up as a true bomber, flew in August of 1940. Then the first production, Halifax, would roll off the assembly line in October. And the squadrons would first receive Halifaxes in November of 1940. They would train on them, and then these would first go on an operational mission on March 10 of 1941. <clears throat> they would be used for both daytime and nighttime bombing missions. Probably one of the first kind of famous missions was in the summer of 1941. Halifaxes were used to attack the German battleship Scharnhorst. But by the end of the year, the daytime raids were more or less canceled because of heavy losses. They did not have fighter support, so they, they pretty much shifted this to being an exclusive night bomber for a bit. So what do we have here? Well, we are shorter than the uh, Sterling. We're at about 71 feet long fuselage. Because this wasn't made under the same requirements as the Sterling, though, its wingspan could be longer. This is 104 foot feet, which actually helps characteristics quite a bit. Interestingly, it has a slightly smaller bomb capacity of 13,000 pounds. The bomb bay itself is a little longer at 22 feet, and it's not divided up like the... Um, like the Sterling, so it can carry slightly larger bombs. It also still has the kind of wing bomb bays. Originally, there would be ability to carry up to six 500-pound bombs in the wings. Later, by the Mark IV, one of the cells bays in the wings would be taken up on each wing by additional fuel tanks, meaning four bombs could be carried on the wings, and even before the Mark IV, this would be done sometimes as an option, but it became a standard feature by then. Originally this would have two turrets, one in the front, one in the back, and it would have two waist guns. Later, the waist guns would be replaced by a dorsal turret on the top there. Ultimately, we would have one Vickers 303 machine gun in the front. And then we would have a quad 303 Browning type. And the, uh, I think, there we go, on the dorsal. And another quad. Browning 303 in the uh, rear turret. They would also redesign the wing edges a bit and the tail a bit throughout production. Again, with lots of British aircraft, we'll go through several marks and variations, and this was no different. It was faster than the Sterling. But more importantly, it had a higher altitude. It could get up to 23,000, 24,000 feet, especially later versions that had uprated engines. Typically, about the largest bombs you see to carry would be about 2,000 pounds. Early on, this plane was considered quite good. Kind of the mainstay of the bomber fleet by 42, 43. They started to be available in 
larger numbers and really by early 44 there were quite a few Halifaxes in uh, RAF service. And kind of after D-Day, daytime bombing would resume with these. In August of that year, they would be used to attack the oil refinery at Hamburg, Germany. This would be one of the first major raids into Germany, and it was quite successful. They would continue throughout the year. And well into 1945, with their last major, major bombing mission in Germany in April of 1945. After that, that was pretty much it. Uh, Coastal Command would also use the Halifax as a patrol ship, kind of an anti-submarine ship, also reconnaissance and all that. They would build just under... 6,200 of these between 1940 and 1945. They would drop just under 225,000 tons of ordnance and uh, a bit under 2,000 would be lost in combat or otherwise. You know, bombers are a dangerous thing on both ends. As I said early on, it was considered quite good. But as the war went on, it was considered to be underpowered. And having somewhat limited bomb capability. Later versions would increase this a bit by added fuel and better engines. But still yet... It was kind of showing that it was started off as a two-engine design, and then it was kind of rushed into production. There were no major flaws with it, which is good. But it also, it didn't have as much adaptability and versatility, especially for range and whatnot, that they could have hoped for. So to that end, production was pretty much wrapped up as soon as the war. I think the last planes came off the assembly line around April of 45. And uh, by 1947, they were declared surplus and most were scrapped. A few were kept in coastal command for a bit, but um, yeah, their days are numbered. They were also used as transport planes a bit before and during and after D-Day in, in the latter stages of the war, but not like the Sterling, really. Still yet, a successful bomber design, and it was available early on in the war when uh, Britain really needed something. And also keep in mind that Germany didn't really have a heavy bomber like it, so it, it did give Britain an edge. So let's move on to kind of the last and most famous, the Avro... Lancaster. Because Avro's Manchester was the winner, it actually delayed the Lancaster quite a bit. The uh, Manchester was ordered into production and went into service in 1940 and quickly didn't do very well. It was considered underpowered. The two Vulture engines just really didn't perform. They also weren't as reliable as uh, one could hope. And uh, really, Avro knew this. In fact, they had been working on a four-engine adaptation, initially known as the Manchester II. And the prototype of this first flew in 1941, in January. And... Uh, Based on everything else, the Air Ministry, the RAF, was very interested and essentially ordered it. So 
So the first production model would roll off the assembly line in October and quickly get delivered to squadrons to practice and learn on and enter into service in 1942. So what do we have here? Well, we're actually the shortest fuselage at just over 69 feet. Our wingspan is 102 feet, so kind of in between the others. Initially, these would have four turrets with uh, two 303 machine guns in the front, top, and bottom, and four 303s in the rear. But quickly, the ventral turret, the bottom turret, would be deleted as it was discovered on the other ones. It just really wasn't worth anything. So just leaving a dorsal. Now on a plane like this, we'll get to in a minute why, even the uh, dorsal turret was deleted for weight and other purposes. So on some models, you would just have the four machine guns in the back and the two in the front. Again, we have a crew of seven. This was markedly faster than the Sterling, and it had a higher altitude than the Halifax. It could get up to 24,500 feet, maybe a little more. Of course, bomb loading had a lot to do with it. And bomb loading is really where this comes into play. It doesn't have the wing bomb cells. Instead, it has just one massive cavernous bomb bay. It's 33 feet long, but it's not obstructed, and it's very deep. So, while originally it could carry 14,000 pounds like the others, it can carry up to about a 4,000 pound bomb, because of the way the bomb bay was designed, it could be easily redesigned, which made this the most versatile of the heavy strategic bombers. Which would eventually lead to why it was so popular and kept in service so long, compared to the rest. So yeah, after this successful prototype, these would go into squadron practice use in late 41 and they would have their first mission on March 2nd of 1942 they would send some out as a sea mine laying exercise and then they would have their first bombing mission over Germany on the 10th of March and this was used as primarily a nighttime bomber not to say that these weren't used during the day some, but mostly nighttime. Keep in mind in 42, there were not really fighter escorts available, at least for the full trip. So, nighttime was what Britain felt was better. And also in 42, while the Lancaster was in service, they were available in very limited numbers. Meaning that the Sterling and the Halifax were pretty much carrying most of the... Uh, most of the bombing activity for that year while production ramped up and Avro could not make enough originally the German uh, the German <laughs> the British uh, RAF ordered 100 excuse me <clears throat> ordered 1070 but of course this was quickly upped but you know pretty good initial for an order so uh, Avro subcontracted out several other factories built these including Canada. These were built in Canada starting in 1942. Remember they considered doing that with the Sterling but they never actually did. And the Manchester, all 200 that were actually built and put into service was actually pulled out of service very quickly in 1942. It just was a pretty failed design. But from a failed design we get to the most successful design of the war. By 43, these started to be available in relatively decent numbers, respectable numbers. You can see how the stand kind of rotates. And 
one of the first major activities that um, the Lancaster was used in was uh, the dam busting raids in May of 1943, the Ruhr Valley raids. And uh, this would be the first time they had to be modified to carry a larger bomb. This would be the 9,200 pound so-called bouncing bomb. They would modify the bomb bay, kind of bulging it out a bit to carry. And so this is really when the when the plane's potential started to be realized. And then that summer, they would send some Lancasters along with the Halifax to bomb Hamburg. And then they would start using these pretty routinely over Germany. Mostly nighttime raids, but sometimes daytime. In 1944, a new type of bomb came into existence. The 12,000 pound so-called Tallboy. This was kind of a, a bunker buster, a, a deep penetration bomb. And... It would be used to attack things like subpins, um, bunkers, other concrete fortifications, and probably most famously, it was used on three different operations to first cripple and then sink the German super battleship Tirpitz. So Lancasters would eventually peck the Tirpitz to death, sending it to the bottom of a Norwegian fjord. In 1944. In fact, speaking of Tallboy, I want to show you a feature of this model. I wanted to pick this up and show you one of the neat features of this model. The bomb bays open up and you can see the large Tallboy type bomb inside and just how big the uh, the bomb bay was on the Lancaster and this is what made this such a popular uh, popular plane and what's neat about this model these doors are metal and they are actually spring-loaded so they actually stay closed very well and you can see how bulged it is in the back like I said just wanted to show you that. The other two models that you can display them with the bomb bay open, but they're more traditional where you can just kind of plug in an open bay or a closed. This actually has an articulated metal bay, which is neat. Some of the other uh, corgis do as well. I think the B-17 and the B-25 do. Like I said, the doors get bulged to carry larger capacities. They also did remove the dorsal turret to save on weight. And because by this point, by 1944, uh, the Allies had air superiority, so on and so forth. You know, it's just they needed to save every ounce of weight they could. And if, as if getting this plane to carry a 12,000 pound bomb wasn't crazy enough, in 1945 they upped the ante even more, going to the so-called Grand Slam or Earthquake Bomb. This thing was ridiculous. It was 22,000 pounds. So very much over the plane's original 14,000 pound maximum bomb load spec. To make this plane carry something that weighed nearly as much as it did, the engines of course had to be changed and upgraded and pretty much every ounce of excess weight had to be stripped off. In fact, they had to remove the bomb bay doors entirely to carry the Grand Slam bomb. And they would first deploy this in March against German installations and use it throughout April to finish off the war. And this was pretty much, the Grand Slam was pretty much the pinnacle of conventional bombs in World War II. I mean, the only thing more powerful would be, you know, the nuclear bomb. 
and only the Lancaster, thanks to its giant bay, could carry it. I mean, there were other bombers that were larger in the war, but... Poof. The Lancaster would be built in quite large numbers. Just under 7,400 would be made. For, with the last one delivered from the factory in February of 1946, so they would keep them in production after the war. During the war, they would drop well over 600,000 in ordnance across Germany. And unfortunately, they would lose over 3,200 planes to either you know direct combat or other incidences. And, and also, unfortunately, the survivability for the plane, for the crew, wasn't as high. Um, these were hard to bail out of. The plane was considered a good one to fly. It had good handling characteristics, decent turning, good speed, good altitude. It was actually quite durable, tough, could take a beating, but if it did go down, it was hard to get out of, just thanks to the design. And a bit of that was kind of the holdover from it originally being a, a two-engine bomber. Just the, uh, the egress hatches were not quite placed right and not quite large enough to really um, provide an easy way to get out. So it was one of the least survivable planes if it was going going down. But other than that, it had a pretty great record and was more or less liked by its pilots a great deal. After the war, these would still be in service, obviously. In 1946, Britain would send some Lancasters on a tour of America. And in actually 1947, they would introduce a new uh, version, new variant, a dedicated specialized photo reconnaissance variant. They stripped off all the armament, gave it a new paint scheme. It was basically a high-speed uh, picture plane. But the bomber variant would be kept in service, as I said at the beginning of this video, through the Korean War, with the last ones being pulled out of Bomber Command in December of 1953, and pretty much the last transport variants being pulled out of service in 1954. This was, by the way, used as a transport for POWs, returning soldiers, what have you, throughout 1945-1946 after the war was over. So it had a, a you know a, a more peacetime application, as did all of these, especially the Halifax and the Lanchester. Lancaster, sorry, Lanchester is a gun. <laughs> For example, during the Berlin. Airlift. So there you have it, guys. A little rundown, kind of a comparison of these various kind of contemporary bombers. The Sterling got them started, and the Lancaster finished it out. Kind of leaving the Halifax as a bit of the middle stepchild. It, I don't know. Not to say it's bad, but it is kind of the most unremarkable of the three. It's better than one, but it came later. I mean, yeah, yeah. They all have their purposes. They all have their things. But um, yeah, the Corgi models are pretty much all the same. I showed you the big difference with the Bombay on the Lancaster. Otherwise. They're all pretty much metal construction, with landing gear up or down, moving turrets, crew figures inside, and just very heavy feeling planes. Corgi seems to do bombers very well. The Sterling and the Halifax came from Pete's Collectibles, which, depending on when you watch this, you can check out the promo code Misha for savings down there. 
And the Lancaster came from Aikens, as it's been out of production for some time. I went with the kind of the tall boy equipped version. They also have a dam buster version and probably even have an earthquake bomb version, but uh, yeah. These are a little too expensive to have more than one variant of. But at least they are sturdy and well done with features. I hope you enjoyed this. I know it was a long one, but I didn't think splitting this up would be helpful for anyone. So I thought we'd just knock it all out at once. Any questions or comments, please post them below. And if you could, check out some other videos and uh, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.